Hear, O Israel. It's a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. So always come before his presence with thanksgiving. Never be ashamed, no matter who's present, to thank God for his goodness. Because his goodness is beyond our imagination. If we could make a list of all the things that we should be thankful for, there would still be many that's not on the list. Because our God is a good God. And he's greatly to be blessed. And so we are thankful for another opportunity to come together for worship, to come together for the study of God's word. But not just worship and study, but to put into practice the things that we discover in his word. We do that when we close our eyes and bow in prayer. We do that when the scriptures are read. We do that when we join in the songs of our faith. So this is another opportunity, which is another gift from God for us to gather in worship. Our method is to have a selection, prayer, the reading of the scripture, and then another selection. And after that selection, Brother Malone will be in charge of the Bible study on this Tuesday. Let us open up the door to our hearts and receive the Spirit of God. We are at worship. Come, singers. Red. 
presence we give thanks to you because you're worthy of all the glory because you're worthy of all the praise as we Good afternoon, family, and also our listening audience. The scripture will be coming from Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verses 1 through 8. Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Give a portion to seven, and also to eight. For thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. If the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if the tree fall toward the south or toward the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. He that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. As thou knowest not what is the way of the spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with the child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. In the morning sow thou seed, and in the evening withhold not thine hand, for thou knowest not whether shall prosper, either this or that, or whether they shall whether they both shall be alike good. Truly, the light is sweet, and a pleasant thing it is for the eyes to behold the sun. But if a man live many years and rejoice in them all, yet let him remember the days of darkness, for they shall be many. All that cometh is vanity. I've read Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verses 1 through 8. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers, hearers, and doers of his holy word. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, it's once again, Lord, that we come into your presence. Lord, we come with praise on our lips and thanksgiving in our hearts. We come with an attitude of gratitude, Lord, just thanking you for the wonderful things that you do for us. Lord, we know that we don't deserve any of it, but we know, dear Heavenly Father, we are your children. And a good father does not abandon his children. Lord, we know, dear Heavenly Father, that in times like these, Lord, we know we need a Savior. And we are thankful, dear Heavenly Father, that you set forth the plan of salvation before the creation of the world. You knew what we was going to be sinful creatures. And we know, dear Heavenly Father, that you had it already in mind that your son, Jesus Christ, was going to save your people from their sins. So he took our sins upon 
upon him, Lord, and he went to the cross and he buried those sins. And Lord, he forgive us for all our trespasses. But he also said that if we confess Jesus with our mouth and we believe in our hearts that God had raised Jesus from the dead, he said we would be saved. So we thank you, Lord, for your plan of salvation. We thank you for the tree of life. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for so much, dear Heavenly Father. When we woke up this morning, Lord, there were so many people that didn't open their eyes this morning. So we thank you that as we looked around, that all was well, that we could see, we could smell, we could touch. Lord, we could walk. And Lord, the blood was still running warm in our veins. We thank you for that, Lord, because as we look around, Lord, the hospitals and the nursing homes and all the different facilities, Lord, are full of sick people. And we too are sick, whether it be physical, emotionally, spiritual, Lord, we all sick people. And we stand in need of a healing. And we know that the healing can come from you. For you have enough healing in the hem of your garments to heal the nations. So, Lord, we ask that you would just allow us to touch just that hem that we may be made whole. Lord, we're concerned about still so much violence in the land. Lord, there's so many young children that are being gunned down. There's so many children that are being abandoned. And, Lord, they didn't ask to be here. But we know, dear Heavenly Father, that there are parents that are walking around. They too are children, just in adult bodies. And Lord, they are not responsible to even have children, but you allowed them to have it. But for some reason, the children have gone wild. Lord, I pray a special blessing, Lord, as the country tries to open back up. I pray that we do it in a wise manner. I know, dear Heavenly Father, that all wisdom comes from you because you already told us that if any man like wisdom, that all we have to do is ask. But I ask, Lord, that you give us the knowledge and the discernment, Lord, that we would do the right thing, that we will, if we haven't been vaccinated, that we would get our vaccine. We will continue to wear our masks. Lord, a day is coming where we can get rid of all of this. And Lord, I know, dear Heavenly Father, you know when that day is, but we don't. And in the meantime, Lord, I pray that we just continue to do that which is pleasing in my sight. Lord, teach us to number our days. There's nothing that we can do to add to our days, but Lord, I know there's things that we can do to shorten them. And being disobedient is one of them. So we ask, dear Heavenly Father, that you would just be in our midst as we just usher your spirit out to those that don't know about your son, Jesus Christ. I pray for, there's a long sick list in our church family. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would just touch Nanny Sue Hall in a special way. Touch Sarah Wilson. Touch Maxine Magruder. Lord, I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would just, just touch so many, Lord. It's, it's just so many, but those just popped out in my head. And I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you would just remember the Moore family that we just funeralized several days ago. Yes. Comfort their family, Lord, in their hour of despair. And then, Father, I pray that as the word come forward, I pray that it would penetrate through the hearts of those who's looking for some good news because your word is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I pray that you give Reverend Malone a fresh anointing, give him what he stands in need of, that he would be able to bring a Bible study that's uncompromising. And then I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that you continue to comfort our pastor. Put your loving arms around him, Lord. 
Give him the strength that he would be able to go on and run just a little while longer to see what the end would bring. And then I pray for the ones that press their way out Wednesday after Wednesday, which we're doing on Tuesday, because they love the Lord. It's not because they're asked to be here. It's, I really believe it's because everyone loves the Lord. And Lord, it's because you first loved us. So I pray that you forgive us for our many sins, which are many. I pray that you would just take the evil thoughts out of our mind. You said you know what's on our tongue even before we speak. So I pray that you give us a clean heart and just renew the right spirit within us. Lord, this is our prayer and our petitions. In the majesty's name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. It is in his name that we do pray. Amen.
will sing and shout the victory. To Pastor Duncan, officers and members of First Virginia Avenue Missionary Baptist Church, supporters, friends of this congregation, we're delighted you've joined us as we are presenting the midweek service, the midweek Bible study for our church. It's a delightful pleasure to be here again, to be able to bring some message from God's word, and we trust that what we deal with today might be a blessing to you as we traverse through this life of troubling times and situations that seem to be uh, growing worse by the moment. But we're, we're delighted to be here and we're thankful to God for the privilege that he has granted unto us to once again stand before you and in your presence uh, to proclaim the word from God. I would like to... Uh, direct your attention this evening to passages of scripture recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14. And I want to read uh, verses 25 through 30. And I, I picked up um, the NIV, so in case you're looking in on King James Version or some other version, the wording might be somewhat different. But verses 25 through 30 is recorded by Matthew chapter 14 in the NIV, read thusly. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, let me come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. For just a few minutes for our study tonight, I'd like to just cap this as a, uh, the topic of this. Peter walked on the water. We all, we all know this uh, this man, Peter, was, was one that gets a lot of comments concerning his speaking before thinking. And, uh, you know, uh, someone even said that he had hoof and mouth disease and he talked before he would think about it. But uh, there are so many things that we can honestly look at in the life of Peter and the wording and the reading that we do concerning his activities as he was following Jesus that we fall in the same groove, the same category. And if we talk about and criticize Peter, we need to first go to the mirror and straighten ourselves out because there are complications that we have in our life that tend to present things to us that uh, cause us to do things on the spur of the moment. And later on, we are sorry that we did it that particular way. But in this narrative, in this passage of scripture that we are, we are studying, tonight, uh, the first part of chapter 14, and according to the Matthew's gospel, has to do with uh, a situation that was depressing to Jesus. And it deals with, in chapter 14, verse 1, the time that Herod uh, has arrested and put in prison John the Baptist the cousin of Jesus. And because of the things that happened and the, 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 the desire to 
to save face and to do things during the birthday party, according to the scripture of Herod. Uh, this woman, Herodias, was their, her daughter was there singing, uh, dancing for the king for his birthday party. And he was pleased with her dance and he decided that he would promise her whatever she wanted in his kingdom, he would make it available to her. I don't know about you, but I too have made promises that I wish at one time that I could have taken back. But it's like those stones that we throw. Once they leave our hand, you, you, you can't retrieve them. And we have very, very strong feelings about things and wish that we could make amends and, and that we could change our mind. Even though Herod was displeased with the situation concerning what John the Baptist had said about him having his brother's wife, he still was a king and the king felt that he needed to flex his muscles. And so if you cross me, John the Baptist, even though I like and Herod, according to the record, he, he liked to hear John preach and teach. But then sometimes, like that story goes, when the man, the pastor was preaching, preaching his heart out about the situation and the conditions among the congregation or all the other people. And Sister Mary sitting there was, yes, preach it, pastor. Preach it, pastor, until he mentioned something about the word gossip and carrying messages and reports and stories and indications about other people. And he started hitting home and she said, do you stop preaching and start meddling? Well, this is the situation that, that, that I think Herod was in at the time. And as a result, he threw John in prison. And John was, was there just, and he, I think he really was going to, going to try to release him secretly later. But because of his party activities and when the daughter of Herodias danced and he was so pleased, he thought, anything in my kingdom, up to half of, I mean, what a promise. I'll give you because he's, he was happy. Moments of ecstasy, moments of praise and joy and thrill in our life and in our heart sometimes will get us into trouble. So she was, this daughter was concerned. She asked her mother, well, what must I ask? And so since she was ticked off with John because she didn't like the fact that he criticized her, who is this? man calls himself a prophet prophesying about me the, and I'm the king's chosen one woman now yeah. so she says ask for the head of John the Baptist on a charger you heard that phrase about your feathers falling and things the bottom falling out you're riding a cloud at one moment and then all of a sudden things seem to have dissipated and they're gone and, and you, you've done something or you've said something that you're sorry about, sorry, and you, but you can't take it back. And that's where Herod was. That was his position at that point. So our pride, our reputation, and our desire to please mankind is something that we hang on to with a tenacious kind of a bulldog grip at times in our life. And this was where Herod was. And since he had made that promise, he didn't want to uh, backtrack on that because all these people there sitting around, it was, it was kind of like uh, when, when uh, was it Xerxes, in, in, um, he got rid of uh, his queen because she wouldn't dance before the people. So he sent for the head of John the Baptist and he brought it in on a charger and, and then the daughter received it and she gave it to her mother and she was happy. No longer will this John the Baptist prophesy and talk about my conduct. This is my business and he doesn't have any right to bring these things uh, before us uh, in the manner in which he has done it. Well, Jesus according to this passage of scripture, had received this message in chapter, the first part of chapter 14. And then he moves on in the middle of that chapter, we see him performing a 
compassionate kind of activity in the midst of the grief and the heartbrokenness that he's experiencing. Because after all, we know that Jesus is 100% man, so he, he had feelings the same as we do because he's human. But Jesus had the ability to be multifaceted. And I think about Louis Lipscomb. Think about multifaceted. He plays the treble clef with the right hand and the bass with the left, and then he's peddling the keys that, with his foot. I'm talking about multitasking. And you know, I can't do one thing. And I, I, what, what was I talking about? I, but God has gifted some of us and some of you with these abilities, and Jesus was the epitome of that. The same thing when he, he was on his way to uh, to see this, this, this daughter that was dying, Jairus' daughter, I think it was, and the woman with the issue of blood approached him. And while he's ministering to the people there, somebody touched him. He says, she just touched his garment. And throngs of people all around. And, and he wonders, who touched me? Yeah. Multifaceting. And the lips give God the praise because you have the ability to do just that too to multifacet in the presence of situations where things go on. And in the midst of all this, Brother Lewis is playing treble clef in one hand and right the bass clef in the other hand and keep boards of bass. And then also he's holding a conversation with somebody at the... <laughs> you know, my brain just does not <laughs> have that many chambers. <laughs> but anyway... Here we are with a situation that Jesus has grown and, he, and he, he's being, his popularity is growing so strong and so fast until at times because of his humanity, he finds it necessary to get away. And he needs to get away and talk to his father. So he, his, the mountains where the crowds are not aware of where he is, is where he chooses to go. And he will get away to hide and to talk to his father in moments like this. And even though he's thinking about doing just that, uh, uh, about the situation concerning his cousin John being beheaded, he sees these people that are following him and he has compassion. Here's that multifaceted talent and a grip that he has on life. And he proceeds at this point to bring some comfort to them. It's getting late in the evening, it appears, and so uh, the, it, it's, it's not going to be time enough for them to go into the village to find food, and the disciples want to send them away and get them out of our hair, you know, let them fend for themselves and find food the best way they can. But Jesus has them sit down, and he performs this miracle, feeding of the 5,000. That's also chapter 14. Well, Back to our, our Peter. Peter, in this ver these verses that I read, it says, during the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the water. Now, Jesus has fed the 5,000. The people are still there, and he's wanting to get away and to talk to his father and to, to, to refill his energies, so to speak. So he has the disciples to go on across the sea. And he takes a trip into the mountains. Talk to daddy. Yeah. And it's while he's, he's doing that, uh, time moves on. And you know, when you are when you when you're in communication with your father, you're doing something that you love, something you love to do and you like, and, and time seems to, it moves faster, and you lose track of it. So time moves on, and according to this passage of scripture, it says, it says the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them. Now he's been, this was before dark, he went into the mountain to pray. You know when the fourth watch of the night is, right? This is between three and six in the morning. And the disciples out there, Jesus sent them across the sea on the boat and they ran into one of those storms that tended to 
impede their progress so much so that even though they were roaring and moving from dust until three or four o'clock in the morning, they weren't getting very far. One step forward, two steps back, and two steps forward, and one, one step. They weren't getting very far, hardly, and they were out there roaring, and, and they couldn't get very far simply because of the wind it was blowing. And behold, here comes someone walking three, four. If you're out anywhere three or four o'clock in the morning and it's dark and someone that you don't know is walking near you, I, I offer that you think probably like the disciples. It's a ghost. <laughs> Must be a ghost. Well, Peter, let me, the verse, and the reason I chose this passage to talk about today, Peter loved to be near Jesus. And I think we can prove that in scripture because he, he always desired, and even to the point where there are comments in the book of John that, concerning John himself, it seems that Peter, I don't, I don't think I would say that he was jealous of John, but I do believe that there was some feeling that, uh, of covetousness concerning the relationship that John had with Jesus that Peter possessed. And as a result of that, he, there were times when he, would, he may have been laying on Jesus' breast but John was already there. There were times when he could have been on Jesus' right hand side, but John was already there. And here is a moment where Jesus, after he says, it is I that I be not afraid, John is back somewhere in the other part of the boat. Peter says, ah, this is my opportunity to get it, because he wanted to be near Jesus. John's out of the picture there, John. I got one up on you, John. I can get to him. So he, it wasn't that Peter wanted to walk on water such, to make a record for himself. It was that he wanted to be close to Jesus. And he continued to make, well, same thing happened on the night of Jesus' uh, trial. And they arrest Jesus and the, the disciples fled. They moved away and, and uh, John was around with his mother, with Jesus' mother, Mary, and the other ladies. But Peter, practicing what we call the first law of nature, self-preservation, he only went just so far, but he was somewhere trying to be near Jesus. He's out there, and this is why he is in the position where he has the opportunity to deny Jesus, is because he was still desiring to be near him. Even out there warming his hands with those other people, he was, he was looking around and he was trying to see. Yeah, Jesus had told him that he's going to deny him before the cock crew. Nah, never. Not me. I would never deny my Lord. But he did it. And he was there not out in the bushes somewhere hiding where the other disciples were because he wanted to be near Jesus. And I say Peter coveted what John had, the relationship John had with Jesus, and it was demonstrated in the things that he did and the activities that he took part of. Well, in this particular case, when he says, he sees, Jesus says, it is I, he says, may I come to you on the water? Well, he wasn't, it wasn't like I said, he wasn't looking for a miraculous feat that he would be credited for, that you and I would be reading about hundreds of thousands of years later. But all he knew was that he wanted to be close to Jesus. So he walks on the water. But then, here again, his humanity shows up when the winds begin to blow. He feels and he wonders, you know, 
who, who, what's going on with me? I, I, I'm doing something supernatural. And, and so and when you start thinking about that, you put some smoke screen between you and the God who created you. And then nothing to happen but to sink. Yeah. And there he goes, down in the water. But don't you know and don't you feel that when you have the relationship of love for God, that all you need to do is call him and he'll bring about what is necessary to rescue you from whatever the problem might be. Or whatever the problem might be, God has, Jesus has the answer and he can provide for you what you need wherever you happen to be. Solitary places don't have to be completely devoid of a feeling when you know and love the true and living God. So here we are with Peter walking on the water, but then he sinks. So God picks him up and he, he Jesus picks him up. He's able to, to save him from drowning. But you know, sometimes... And I think I said some other time, what happens to us as we study God's word and as we receive the messages that he has for us on a Sunday morning or on a Tuesday night or on a Wednesday at noon or whenever, we tend to lose the grip on the total message. And it's safe to say that we leak. So we got to come back again and again and again to be refilled and to be refilled re-energized as a result of what has happened. And as a result of that, the same thing happened with Peter. And he needed to be refilled even though he, his cup may have run over uh, at the time that he was in the presence of Jesus and he could get the, the, the all of the love and any concern and compassion from Jesus that he, he desired to see and to feel. Well, this is all before the crucifixion. Jesus is tried. He is crucified on a cross. And on the third day, he rose from the dead and he had appeared to the disciples in that room they were all there except Thomas. And then he appeared one week later and Thomas was there because Thomas doubted and he said, I will not believe unless I can put my fingers in the holes in his hand and put my fist or my hand in his side where they pierced him with the spear. I just, I just won't believe it. I got to see this. You know, I was born in Missouri. And I got to see this thing. And so as a result of that, here he is the third time he's appearing to the disciples. Because later on, what happens to us in life when, when the bottom seems to fall out? We tend to fall back on those things that we've gotten support from. We fall back on those things that have given us a lift, that have carried us through the dark trenches of life. And fishing was what the disciples, God chose, he, Jesus chose these guys because these, these guys were networkers, one with the other, in dealing with the industry of catching fish. And Jesus wanted to convert them from fish catchers to men catchers. And this is exactly what he did in three and a half years. He presented them with this message. So hereafter, he has has risen from the grave. He had appeared to the disciples twice before, as I mentioned. And they are out, when Peter had decided, well, he's gone. I'm going fishing. I'm going back to doing, and we do these same things in our life when we miss the step. We go back to the sinful acts. And it happens in all areas. And I want to just tell you one little story about a situation like that. When I was in school in D.C., there was a young man that used to teach a Sunday school class that I attended. And he told us 
quite often that he was an alcoholic, a super, super dynamic Sunday school teacher. And he said to us that he was so hooked as an alcoholic that he could no longer use an aftershave. It was enough alcohol in a couple of spurts of, of the aftershave, the cologne to put on, that would trigger him to a point where he'd have to have some drink. So he couldn't even put aftershave on because he was alcoholic. And so those things that were part of your life, you fall back on because they're crutches that you lean on. And this is the same thing Peter was doing. He says, I'm going fishing. Jesus is gone. He's dead. You know, even though they had seen him, but he knew they knew that he was he was going away. So he went fishing. So there were six or seven of those disciples went with him. And while they were out there fishing all night long, they caught nothing. And it was beginning to dawn to the early morning and they look over and there's a person over there on the bank and he says, hey, fellas, you catch anything? The answer is no. He says, come on over for breakfast. Have you been invited to breakfast one morning uh, unexpectedly? Maybe it was uh, your birthday and somebody decided to do breakfast in bed. And I don't think I ever want that. I've never been treated like that, but I don't think I want breakfast. <laughs> But Jesus called them up. They hadn't caught a thing, but when they get off the boat, they go over to him. They Here again, John is on that boat with, with Peter and, and five or six others that are there fishing. And John is the one that always recognizes, even in the dark of night, in the distance that may separate them, when Jesus is present, John says, it is the Lord. And that was all Peter needed to hear. When, he, when Jesus walked by them on the boat, on, out there when they were out on the boat, Peter jumps up and runs. So he's a it's an opportunity to get close to Jesus and he walks on the water. This time, Jesus is on the land and Peter is out in the water. Peter had his clothes off, you know, but he put on his article and with clothes and all, he bounces in because he wanted to get close to Jesus. Get back close to Jesus. In the water he goes. So Peter is there and after they've eaten the only, the gospel of John records the message that Jesus had with Peter. Do you love me? Peter says, yes, I love you, Lord. You know I love you. He says to him, if you love me, feed my sheep. He asked Peter this same question three times. And, and I think Peter was a little offended after he had, uh, he had asked him. And, and he, he says, he indicated, yes, Lord, you know I love you. You know all things. You know that I love you. But there again, you know, we talked about us leaking. Even though the messages from God Almighty, from Jesus, the Son of God, had been presented to Peter, and he had been filled, his cup had been filled to overflowing many, many times, but he did like we do. He leaked. He forgot some of those things, some of those messages, some of those admonishments that came from, from God, from Jesus. And in the midst of all of that, he needed refilling. So there again, that covetousness of the relationship that John had with Jesus manifested again. And Peter asked him, what about this guy that's following us? John, what's going to happen to him? Jesus says to him, he don't worry about what's going to happen to him. You just follow me. Peter was never able to get that thing completely out clearly from his mind because there was that in my mind that sense of covetousness concerning the relationship that John had with Jesus that Peter wanted so much to have 
or I offer to us today that what we need is the desire to be closer to him and to clamor moment by moment to be in the presence of Jesus and to be what he wants us to be. But we must remember and don't let this leak out of your cup. The answer that Jesus gave, gave him. Don't worry about him. You just follow me. And Peter, or John rather, ends his book, the Gospel of John. He says, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. And this was on the testimony that Jesus had given to Peter. Just take care of you. When I was younger, so that was a long, long time ago, I think it was the Fairfield Four recorded a song. It said, six months of the year, mind your own business, and six months of the year, leave the other fellow's business alone. Good message, good sermon. And I hope that as a result of what my rambling may have presented to you today, concerning this man Peter and his desire to be close to Jesus is to maintain the focus for yourself to stay in touch with God, to stay in touch with Jesus yourself and not worry about, other, about the other fellow. Make sure that they get the word, but the message completely is that you stay in touch and your witness, your life, your walk will be a testimony to those that have not heard. Peter walked on the water. Anybody here ever walk on water? I don't, I don't even like water <laughs> that well. But with God, all things are possible. That's the message I wanted to leave with you today. You too can walk on water if you focus your attention and allow your strength to come from the one who has all strength, Jesus the Christ, our Savior. It's your message for today. Thank you.
feel like shouting Hallelujah Since I laid my burden down Feel like shouting Hallelujah Since I laid my Glory, glory, hallelujah, since I laid my burdens down. Glory, glory, hallelujah, since I laid my Thanks to my dear brother Amen. for that presentation of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Now that some of the restrictions are being lifted, mm -hmm. there is a need for me to come before you again. So in the next few days, it is my intention to get in touch with all of you by mail that we might address the new situation of being able to worship with less prescription, Oof. less restrictions, not prescriptions. <laughs> <laughs> so be on the lookout for the mailman. Mm. We've come so very, very far. Yes, sir. Mm. And we have come in the middle of the arms of God. And we're going to keep on going, mm. doing our part, because we are workers together with God. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. It's God that has the work, and we are working with him. There is no doubt concerning God accomplishing his work because God will keep his word. Mm -hmm. But there may be some doubt when it comes to us keeping our word. Mm -hmm. But we are laborers together with God. Eternal God, we cannot approach your throne mm -hmm. without giving you thanks. Before we ask for anything, mm. the first thing that should come out of our mouths yes. is to address you yes. and to thank you, thank you Lord. for all the blessings that we continuously receive yes, throughout the day. There has never been a day when we were not the recipient of some of your blessings. And so we have learned to count on you. And I pray that you shall be able to count on us. Continue the presence of your Holy Spirit in the hearts of each one of us. Speak to us, touch us, strengthen us, and guide us. All in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, and the church saved. Church say, God has spoken. God has spoken. 
Let the church. 